Hello and a warm welcome to this evening's event titled Criminalizing the Buying of Sex, Experiences from the Nordic Countries, hosted by the LSE European Institute. I'm Dr. Orla Kadam and I am an LSE Fellow in International Migration at the European Institute. I'm excited to be chairing this fantastic event today and delighted to welcome our speakers. Before I do, however, I have a few housekeeping announcements. For those Twitter users in the audience, the hashtag for today's event is hashtag LSE Europe. This event is being recorded and will hopefully be made into podcasts subject to no technical difficulties. Our event will consist of presentations from our speakers followed by Q&A with the audience. When we come to the Q&A portion of our event, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Questions will be submitted to myself and I will pose as many as many to our speakers. Please do let us know your name and affiliation. Now on to introducing our wonderful speakers. Our very own Dr. Nina Volajavi is an assistant professor in international migration at the LSE European Institute. Her interdisciplinary research is situated in the fields of migration, feminist and socio-legal studies. Nina received her PhD in sociology from Rutgers University in 2021. Julian Curico is a Swedish current full service sex worker and is currently the chair of Red Umbrella Sweden. He has worked as a sex worker in conditions such as the Swedish model and different types of regulated legalization. Elaine Lam is an activist, community organizer, educator and human rights defender. She has devoted herself to defending the rights of and empowering marginalized communities, particularly sex workers migrants and precarious workers for over 20 years. She is the founder of Butterfly, Asian and Migrant Sex Workers Support Network in Canada. She holds a Master's of Laws and Master of Social Work. Anna Bush is a researcher on Western Europe and women's rights at Am Amnesty International's Europe Regional Office. She was the lead researcher on women's access to justice for rape in Europe as part of Amnesty's Let's Talk About Yes project and is the author of Amnesty's recently released report on sex workers' human rights in Ireland. Charlotte Lee is a spokeswoman for the English Collective of Prostitutes. The English Collective of Prostitutes is a grassroots organization of sex workers and supporters campaigning for the decriminalization of prostitution, for sex workers' rights and safety, and for resources to enable people to get out of prostitution if they want to. And last but not least, Suzanne Hoff, who since 2004 has been international coordinator of Estrada International, the European NGO platform against trafficking in human beings. As international coordinator, Suzanne is responsible for the development of counter trafficking strategies and policies, advocacy and representation. So without further ado, I'm now delighted to hand over to Nina to begin her presentation. Off to you, Nina. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome on my behalf as well. Um, I am here uh, to talk about my forthcoming policy brief, criminalizing the sex buyer um, experiences uh, from the Nordic region, um, that is based on my recently finalized uh, dissertation uh, research. Um, the, this brief will be published uh, in June uh, by the LSE's uh, Women, Peace and Security Institute, so stay tuned. So before I go to the brief, I wanted to say a few words about, um, about the sex buyer law or so-called Nordic model to give you a little introduction on the topic of the evening. So this policy model originates uh, in Sweden uh, that in 1999 was the first country to criminalize the buying but not the selling of sex, relying on radical feminist arguments uh, of commercial sex as violence uh, against women. Sweden was soon followed by Norway, uh, Finland and Iceland with similar types of legislations and hence it is often uh, um, it often goes by the name Nordic model. The reasoning behind this law is uh, that without buyers, uh, the so called demand, there wouldn't be any sex industry and trafficking. Uh, so it aims to eradicate uh, commercial sex uh, in total. And because women uh, in this model uh, are, uh, are seen as victims, uh, they should not be further punished, but instead protected. 
Uh, it is a highly symbolic law uh, and the, it is meant to advance gender equality at large in society. So what I wanted to find out in my research uh, was uh, firstly, how this law affects uh, sex workers and people in the sex trade and especially their vulnerability uh, for violence and exploitation. Secondly, uh, because uh, migrants nowadays form the majority of people um, in the Nordic sex trade, I wanted to know how uh, the policing of commercial sex uh, under the Nordic model interacts with immigration policies and their enforcement. So to examine these questions, um, I did a vast uh, three country research in the Nordic region, mainly among migrants who sell sex, but also with nationals uh, and the police forces and poli police forces and social service providers. So in addition to field uh, observations and discussions that uh, kind of form the core of ethnographic work, I also did 210 uh, formal interviews out of which majority uh, were with people who had experience of selling sex. So I'll move to the core findings of the research now. So uh, what my findings show is that uh, there is a great discrepancy between the ideological discourse that equates commercial sex uh, with violence and sex trafficking and the realities of people uh, who sell sex. Only majority, only small uh, minority of those interviewed, 6% uh, considered themselves to have been trafficked or forced by someone else uh, to sell sex. And these findings are in line with, um, with other European and international studies. So intention to earn money was cited as the single biggest motivator, irrespective of people's feelings or interpretations uh, of the sex trade. Moreover, my research shows that instead of uh, sex buyers and pimps, uh, the troubles that people encounter in commercial sex were more often related to the institutional structures of immigration and prostitution policies that created vulnerability uh, uh, to violence and exploitation. Uh, and let me illustrate this point further with my other findings. So despite the explicit aim uh, of this policy to shift attention away uh, from people to sell sex and direct it uh, to sex buyers, uh, sex workers and people in the sex trade are still main targets of policing. So the sex, uh, according to my research, the sex buyer criminaliz criminalization actually has a minor role in policing. Instead, it functions together with anti-trafficking efforts as a smokescreen for punitive and racialized policing of people in the sex trade that often leads to evictions and deportations. And to understand um, this, these mechanism, mechanisms, uh, we need to look at the regulation of commercial sex uh, in the region more in detail. So even though Nordic countries have decriminalized the sale of sex, it is de facto criminalized through other legislations. Firstly, uh, uh, the sale of sex is a ground of deportation and denial of entry in the country's immigration laws. So this practically criminalizes uh, migrant uh, sex work. Secondly, the Nordic countries also have a broad third party legislation whereby all assistance in the, sex, in the sale of sex is prohibited, even if it's not for profit. And what this means is that uh, regular hotel owners and landlords can be accused of pimping if someone is selling sex on, on their premises um, and the police uses uh, uh, this law to, um, as a way to clear a sex trade out of indoor markets during uh, client and anti-trafficking investigations. So what they do is that they inform the landlord that if they do not evict the person, uh, they will be accused of pimping. And usually the landlord choose um, to evict the person. So uh, these policing efforts uh, have led to a dire housing situation, especially for migrants, uh, which can actually increase uh, um, 
uh, exploitation in third party arrangements, because uh, when when people don't have formal ways of acquiring housing, they need to turn to informal uh, channels, uh, which can be more exploitative because the people know that you're going to sell sex there um, and also take the risk of being accused of pimping. Secondly, uh, this kind of policing has worsened uh, um, uh, relationships with officials because sex workers and people in the sex trade are afraid to report violence and exploitation to the police, fearing that uh, these reports would lead to deportations and, and evictions. It is therefore um, not maybe surprise in the light of these findings that the vast majority of interviewees, 96% uh, oppose the sex buyer law and support removing criminal penalties related um, to the sex trade. Before I move to conclusions, uh, I want to say uh, a few words about the social and support service dimension. Um, so the social and support services uh, were supposed to be the backbone of the of the uh, of this policy approach, uh, and and the sex buyer law was only meant to be a normative supplement um, to these services that would help people to find uh, other ways of income. However, um, these services have not realized, uh, for example, uh, Sweden hasn't assigned any funding uh, for these, for these uh, measures, social measures, after the passing of the law. Instead, most of the funding um, uh, related to the law has gone to uh, police forces and increased policing. Uh, another problem related to the um, uh, uh, social service uh, or service provision is that um, because the overwhelming, overwhelming majority of people engaged in sex work in the region are migrants without permanent residence permits, uh, they are not entitled to the state services such as uh, social benefits and, and public housing. Thirdly, um, in Sweden, the wide uh, adaptation of understanding of commercial sex as a form of violence against women has meant that service provision has mostly focused on counseling. Uh, what this has meant in Sweden is that there is a very limited access to low threshold STI testing health and legal services, which are essential for migrants uh, when they do not have access to state services. So in other words, this has uh, led to uh, exclusion of, of a majority of people engaged in the sex trade uh, from, uh, from the services in Sweden. So in conclusion, um, we can see that uh, despite the rhetoric of protecting women and people in the sex trade, the main goal uh, of the Nordic model style regulation uh, is the abolition of commercial sex. And this is achieved through punitive policing of sex workers and people in the sex trade. Um, so the evidence in this study indicates that the Nordic model is not actually a model to be replicated, but rather a complex, complex regulatory apparatus designed to disrupt the commercial sex market. I will conclude with my three core policy recommendations. Uh, in the policy brief, I will discuss this uh, more in detail, but I will just mention these three uh, here in these presentations. So there are three main policy recommendations rising from this study. First of all, a removal of criminal penalties related to consensual commercial sex to protect the safety and integrity of people in the sex trade. And this would mean uh, decriminalizing the selling and buying of sex, as well as removal of criminal uh, prohibitions on non-exploitative third parties. Uh, as my research shows, uh, we can see how um, these uh, so-called pimping laws can be easily used uh, against people who sell sex, like in the case of the Nordic model. Uh, secondly, this research points to a need uh, to reform immigration policies so that selling of sex is not penalized in immigration laws. And thirdly, and most importantly, I think this study demonstrates how the rhetoric of protection and working on the be behalf of the vulnerable can become misguided if people who are most affected uh, by these policies are not centered in the policy making and service provision. Um, therefore, this research highlights the necessity of centering the needs and realities of sex workers and people uh, in the sex trade in these processes. 
I will end here. Thank you so much. Uh, and um, here's just information to contact me and also more information about the policy brief that will be published uh, within a month. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. And um, over to you now, Julian. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Nina and Ola and everyone else who is here. Uh, my name is Julian Curico, uh, and I am a full service sex worker and also the chair of Red Umbrella Sweden. Um, and our organization is uh, an organization for sex workers. Um, we do a lot of uh, community building, uh, peer support, uh, but also advocacy. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, like what we see in our communities. Uh, is also um, that it's highly racialized, uh, the policing, um, like hotel staff is being trained to uh, spot sex workers, for example. Uh, and then, yeah, one component of that is racialization. Uh, and also it happens to both trans and cis women. Um, yeah, like sex workers who work in Sweden come from many different backgrounds. Uh, and a lot of us are also excluded in the debate uh, because the whole narrative is that, uh, yeah, this is men's violence against women. Um, but there are yeah, people of all genders working in the sex industry uh, and also in uh, Sweden. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I don't know, like uh, different things that happen uh, in the last time, for example, uh, there is a proposition to increase uh, the criminalization of uh, the purchase of consensual sexual services, for example. Uh, this is going to be voted on on the 21st of June. Uh, we just had a protest in Stockholm uh, last Saturday uh, to oppose this uh, because we uh, fear that this will make it already uh, existing uh, harmful conditions even worse. Um, yeah, like uh, Nina was saying in the uh, present short presentation before, uh, like people get evicted. Uh, we had a member uh, that got evicted a few years ago from her flat. Uh, she is um, uh, now living somewhere else uh, with her partner uh, who also got uh, suspected of being a pimp. Uh, for living together with her. Uh, we've had police raids of other members, uh, police coming and also like humiliating the person who they are trying to protect uh, and also acting in a way in front of neighbors uh, and friends of the sex workers uh, where they get exposed and outed as sex workers, uh, which also affect um, access to other jobs, for example. Um, uh, one second, sorry, I'm a little bit nervous. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, I definitely agree with uh, um, taking away the criminalization and to decriminalize, because uh, that's basically what we are calling for as an organization and also as a global community uh, of sex worker rights uh, activists and anti-trafficking organizations and human rights organizations. Uh, but it is a little bit disheartening to see that um, the country where this uh, Sex Purchase Act uh, is coming from, uh, the, the stigma and the kind of view on sex workers and to eliminate us without having any kind of plan for us um, shows that it's really going the other direction there and that uh, they want to criminalize us even more um, and yeah we're like very worried about where this is going to head like are we going to get criminalized directly with fines are we going to be put in uh, jail like uh, and also if the client uh, gets more criminalized it's also going to mean like a lot more uh, police following sex workers and that means a lot more deportations uh, a lot more people who want people to enter the country uh, and also that the stigma is going to increase even more uh, because it's not only like when we deal with authorities that we have problems uh, it's also uh, with our families uh, and with all the kind of um, disdain that actually 
exists for sex workers in Sweden, uh, like going to a doctor or a psychologist and not being able to be honest because of the kind of uh, stigma that you face is also really um, a big issue because it means that we don't have the same access uh, as everybody else. Um, and uh, yeah, like, I don't know, the way I see it is that it just, yeah, it feels like a mixture of a moralistic uh, kind of uh, agenda uh, and then being used as a border control um, to really exclude uh, racialized people and migrants, uh, both from inside of Europe uh, and from outside of Europe. Um, so yeah, um, we definitely uh, think that the Swedish model is uh, very paternal and it feels also like a neo-colonialist kind of uh, uh, model because it aims to spread and it wants to be a global kind of uh, solution. Uh, but in all countries that we talk to people and we see what happens, it's a catastrophe. Uh, and especially if you look at uh, like the other countries where this has been exported, it's uh, the population is a lot bigger than in Sweden. So there's so many more people uh, in the, the, that are sex workers that are affected by this. And so many more migrants that are uh, migrating there to work. Uh, so I think it's super important that, yeah, we try to really um, get this across because in Sweden, when we talk to media and we talk to politicians, etc., they won't even, listen to us like they ignore us on a regular basis um and it kind of gets twisted into that we are um the bad people or whatever uh and in reality they are the ones persecuting us and being extremely racist so um yeah i don't know <laughs> what else i can say but uh open for any questions after thank you very much for inviting me to this also thank you so much julian Elaine, if you could please go ahead. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Elaine Lam. So I'm from Butterfly, which is an Asian and migrant sex worker support network. So I'm so glad to have a chance to join here because I think this is a very, very important research because this is what exactly what uh, we see every day in um, the world of Butterfly. You know, people keep being arrested, detained and deported, how they are being harassed and evicted. And I think this is very, very important, particularly Canada also criminalizing the client and using protect women as the cover of the real project actually is killing the business of sex worker, uh, killing the life of sex worker. Actually, this is a project not ending violence of sex worker, but putting violence of sex worker by imposing the moralistic idea and by um, uh, taking away um, the ability of the worker uh, being safe and also is promote the hate of the sex worker from the uh, community, just like Julian say, people think sex worker is criminal, they think sex worker is bad people, they think that they are victim. But the anti-trafficking movement is very successful because they make the people think this is a human rights thing, this is a good thing to protect women, and they become the hero. We can see how like the state is so supporting with the NGO, particularly the that those have religion background promoting it. So I think this is so, so, so important. I know he has a lot of researcher and activists, and I think that how we we do not only like use this panel as, as you know, to, to fill in your research interest, but also how we can work together to push back um, this harmful policy. And maybe I give a little bit background. So in like in Canada, actually, sex work has been long been criminalized, but particularly migrant sex worker is like being targeted. So, um, but the sex worker organization have challenged um, the sex work law so that they do not allow the sex work, uh, sex worker to find the client on the streets and also like um, cannot work together. So because it makes sex work unsafe. So that's why in 2013, actually Supreme Court said, no, 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 this is the law really uh, put the sex worker in danger so that they over with this law, they order the state need to come up with a new law. Unfortunately, at that time is the um, conservative government, so they have so strong policing 
um, like criminal agenda, particularly um, with the support of those anti-trafficking organizations. But many of them, they call themselves feminists. I don't call them feminists because they love police. They love the prison more than the women. They are not the real feminists because what they advocate for actually is make sex worker, make many migrants the life more suffering. So, but this organization, what we see, who are they? So many is having the strong, strong time with the religion group. They are promoting the idea sex work is, is immoral. But because this language did not get so many people accepted because like me, more and more people in the society recognize the agency of the woman. Then they change the language. When you go to the mission, it's very clear that they are ending pornography, ending sex work. But when they present, they say, oh no, I respect sex work. I just want to end exploitation. I end human trafficking. So that's why they can get so much support. And with this like background, so that Canada have passed the law. And, and the law is 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 before it's already very bad. Now it's even worse because one, they criminalize client and also they criminalize any communication with client. We know it is very important. But at the same time, actually they criminalize sex work itself, but they make the illusion people believe that oh, sex work is not criminalized. Sex worker is not criminalized in Canada. This is like the idea promoted by those um, anti-sex work organizations say, oh no, I'm not criminalized sex worker, but it's not true. The law itself is still criminalized sex worker, but they give the immunity of sex worker. But again, all the activity of sex worker is criminalized and particularly um, related to third party client. And for Asian and migrant sex worker, I think it's similar to this research that the criminal law is being used as the tool to arrest the sex worker and particularly migrant sex worker. And as Julian said, there is a lot of training how to identify human trafficking. And I love the work of Julian talk about not only the law, but the anti-trafficking movement also give a lot of resources for the police and how to work with the NGO to have the power of enforcing the law. So they have like lock and talk. They will not go to the very expensive hotel, go to the white local sex worker hotel room to lock, right? They will go to the migrant sex worker that the hotel has policing reporting them, you know, or the cheaper motel, they will lock and talk. Then when we um, hear the training of the police, they will go to the internet to find particular Asian workers because they think they have no brain, they are being trafficked. But what we experience um, uh, are told by the worker is like when they lock, they are being asked if anyone take your money and also, and then they will ask the passport and they will arrest and detain. And for migrant sex worker, this is an amazing community, how people support each other to overcome language barrier, overcome they do not familiar with the place. So sex worker um, may need someone to help them to um, post the internet. They may not have a credit card or they may not be able to communicate. They may need someone to connect them with the client, answer the phone. But all these activities are criminal. Many of them is also the sex worker or some sex worker, they are experienced in sex industry. They may try to help each other. Now we just have like few workers, they are being charged, arrested and uh, um, put in the prison. But at the same time, if you are the migrant, they're not saving you, right? That they are not, they use saving you as the excuse to, to let the police have power to do this invasive thing in your home and your workplace. And then the, uh, the migrant sex worker often get uh, deported. And, but this kind of violence, this is exactly the violence. The workers say the money being taken away, the, the phone being taken away. One of the workers said that when she was sleeping, she did not wear clothes and the, the police just break the door. And when they enter, and then she was handcuffed and the police asked, are you safe? She said, before you come, I was safe. And then after that, they sent a social worker that like, what do you need? And give her a very shitty phone. But this is like every day keep happening because in addition to criminal law, they also have a huge funding and work with the NGO to make it legitimate. This look like something really helping the, the women. So, and I think this is very, very important to know about the real purpose of the project. It's not about the safety of the women because so many migrant organizations talk about how to make migrants safe, how to make the uh, working conditions safe. It's workers' rights. 
the status, which is very important, that they are not advocated in Canada. There are few anti uh, trafficking organizations, particularly actively uh, lobby to shut down the massage parlor, particularly the Asian migrant sex worker. When we talk migrant, we talk about the experience of migration. Some, some people even have permanent resident or citizen. But because they get criminal charge, they may also get deported, even they have status. So for those they have peculiar status, they are more difficult and they are advocate more political to the case and also change the bylaw to make the work become illegal that they have the excuse. And they, they explicitly say stopping migrants from working so that when you see the proposal is not about care about the working condition, it's nothing about care about the rights, they just want to end sex industry, this is their mission the moralistic agenda. This is how they benefit. When we talk about exploitation, who is benefit? I do the Google, how much police they can get, like few times increase of the salary after they go to the anti-trafficking project. You see how much the NGO, they can get so much funding, particularly when those NGOs is supporting the policing agenda, they are advocate for those uh, past and feminist uh, approach. So, and in Canada, what happened is the sex worker organization is challenging the uh, law again. So we are launching the constitution challenge. So, and the parliament is doing the um, uh, review of the, the law, but it's very, very disappointed those anti-sex um, worker organization is still, using trafficking as the excuse to end sex industry, promote the criminalization. But we also need to call for those organizations keep silence. I need to call them out. So for example, Elizabeth Fry, they are the big organization. They, they said they you support the people in prison. Yeah, so that's why I think this is a very important that some organizations, they are silenced, they need to speak out because they see how people, particular women migrants suffer from the criminal system you know, problematic uh, immigration policy. So we have so much uh, resources we put on the uh, website and love to uh, continue uh, to, to um, uh, check. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Elaine. Anna, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you to Ola and Nina and to all the speakers. Um, and I'm Anna Bush, I'm a researcher at Amnesty Zero Regional Office. Um, and uh, we recently, a few months ago, launched this new research on sex workers' human rights in Ireland. So that's what I'm going to talk about a little bit. Um, and I want to also quote some of the workers who we spoke to. Um, so thanks a lot for the opportunity. We really tried with this research to center sex workers' voices, and it was really paramount to us that um, as people who are very often, as, as many of you said, not listened to and not given a seat at the table, um, we really wanted to, to make that the core of the report that we published. Um, and many of many things that many of you um, mentioned before, so like the moralistic agendas behind um, laws governing sex work, um, and what Elaine mentioned, especially this illusion that the Nordic model um, does not criminalize sex workers is very much what was um, very, very prominent in, in, in our research on this. And what happened in Ireland, um, I think, illustrates this illusion idea quite well, because in 2017, Ireland introduced the Nordic model. So the buying of sex was criminalized, um, but also offenses such as brothel keeping and living on the proceeds of prostitution, um, were kept in, in during that law reform. And, and not only that, they were also the criminal penalties for them were increased. So for example, at the moment for so-called brothel keeping, which in fact can mean two or more sex workers working from the same premises, um, it carries a possible fine of 5,000 euros, which is huge, and or imprisonment for up to 12 months or even longer if the matter reaches a higher instance court. Um, and in these provisions, there is no distinction made between exploitative involvement of third parties and, and involvement and help and support that people may want to um, enter into. So for example, as, as some of you are mentioning, in terms of having a colleague taking calls, 
um, or having security or just literally working with another colleague for safety. Um, so this was one of the main um, aspects of, um, of the impact of, of this legal framework and policies in Ireland that was uncovered during our research. Um, and beyond that, we um, heard a lot from sex workers about their experiences of violence and how the policies and the context um, shapes their lives in terms of how um, unsafe they feel. Um, and again, exposing these claims that very often uh, are made when, when these kind of laws are being introduced, that this is to protect people's safety. Whereas in reality, we really see that is absolutely not the case, unfortunately. Um, and really all these individual experiences and the attacks that sex workers shared with us. So for example, physical attacks, threats, um, sexual violence, stalking, um, harassment and all of this. Um, for us, it was really important to situate this in the context of structural violence. So, um, you know, the different aspects that contribute to this and that exacerbated and that are really among the root causes of, of these experiences. So on one hand, the legal and policy framework. So as I said, the criminalization of different aspects of sex work. Um, then the policing as well. So very much uh, similar findings to what Nina was um, sharing uh, in terms of how racialized it is, how it um, is directed at certain populations, how there is no uh, separation of powers in terms of um, the same police officers being in charge of raiding uh, brothels and spaces where sex workers work, um, being the same officers who, for example, are also tasked with uh, or can be tasked with immigration enforcement, uh, and also the same ones to whom theoretically sex workers can come with any concerns and any reports of violence and, and even for protection. So because these are the same officers, um, it's really not working in practice, unfortunately. Um, all of this as well uh, is very much connected uh, with the pervasive stigma, as many of you mentioned already, as you know, Julian outlined, for example, um, there's so much stigma around this, very strongly connected to harmful gender stereotypes. Um, you know, it, 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 ideas around gender norms, around sexuality, um, around what sex work is, around consent, um, in the Irish context, particularly also influenced very much by um, issues with um, you know, the legacy of the Catholic Church and how this has shaped different societal uh, beliefs, um, but also the institu institutionalization of, um, of women and others who didn't um, follow certain gender and sexuality norms over the years. Um, and Sorry. Um, just to go back a little bit and more in depth uh, and talk a bit more about the brothel keeping um, aspects. So the criminalization of, in fact, you know, two or more sex workers um, working together. Um, I want to quote Nia, who is a mixed race uh, Irish sex worker and who spoke about um, the impact of racialization that she experiences on how she can exercise her human rights and, and the consequences of the criminalization of brothel keeping for her personally. So she said this, I don't want to risk anything, especially with the brothel keeping, because again, it's a lot of foreign nationals that are being prosecuted for it in Ireland. I am looked at as a foreign national, even though I'm not. So I'm more likely to be prosecuted for that. So I don't feel comfortable working with someone else because I would face repercussions to that, unfortunately. And there was a very widely publicized case that uh, really a lot of media um, picked up on uh, in 2019 when two sex workers from Romania, two women were convicted of brothel keeping. Um, one of them was pregnant at the time and they were given um, jail sentences for that. Um, you know, and it really, again, shows that, um, it shows the impact and very, very serious consequences to people's lives of, of when working together for safety is criminalized. Um, 
And when we interviewed representatives of Irish authorities for this report, um, some of them were telling us that there are in fact very few prosecutions and very few convictions for brothel keeping and, and that would um, kind of follow and, and be similar to this case. And even though that may be the case, um, the important factor here is this so-called chilling effect of these laws because they effectively um, prevent people from working together for safety because many people just simply cannot risk this kind of criminalization um, from the Irish police, from the state, especially um, if you're undocumented and if you're a migrant in general because for example, one of the workers told us that, um, you know, if anything happened to them, um, they would not be comfortable reporting violence to um, the Gardaí, the Irish police, because they would like to apply for Irish citizenship one day. So here's what they said. And this person experienced three violent incidents, including or rape. Um, and they told us this. The only time I would call the cops would be if I was dying on the floor. I don't trust them. I strictly work by myself because I have that fear. I want to get Irish citizenship. Any criminal record would be detrimental. If I'm working with someone else, it's putting me at higher risk. I'd personally rather be at a risk with a client than with a police officer. I don't want to go to jail. I'll kill myself. And then in terms of the ban on buying sex in itself, um, sex workers also told us that it's impacting very much on on one hand their autonomy well-being and safety because it really prevents you from being able to screen clients properly um, and then on the other hand on their ability to earn a living um, so for example sex workers told us that um, it often forces them effectively to engage in more risky behaviors um, for example, Vanessa, who is a worker um, from Ireland working mainly in street settings, told us this. I remember one night in particular, I was going down a cul-de-sac that was discreet, so I wasn't going to be found by the guards there. They couldn't drive by the spot we were in, but at the same time, I had no escape route if anything went wrong. And that was a very direct result of the guard presence there targeting the clients. So yeah, they're not targeting me, but it has as much of an effect on my ability to survive if they want. And we very much found that both among the Irish and migrant sex workers that we spoke to, um, the trust in the police was really non-existent. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's quite understandable considering that it's the same police officers that they are supposed to report violent incidents to and, and contact for any protection and safety concerns that could um, raid the premises that they work from, that could open a case against them for working together, that could deport them from the country. Um, we also came across concerns with regard to economic and social inequalities and rights in this research. Um, in the context, especially of the housing crisis that is currently taking place in Ireland. Um, and very much related to this, and where these provisions in Irish law, again, that criminalize aspects of sex work that are kind of connected to it. So again, not directly the selling of sex, but there is this provision on so-called living on the earnings of prostitution. And that can have very specific negative consequences on sex workers right to adequate housing um, because landlords renting flats and, and houses to sex workers can be prosecuted under these provisions so Anna, one of the wrap, sorry to interrupt you but if you could wrap up now please no problem no problem um yeah so just to maybe to summarize some of our key recommendations as amnesty to the Irish authorities that I think are applicable to other um, states with these kind of legal models. So first of all, we recommend that all aspects of sex work are decriminalized. Uh, we recommend that state authorities listen to sex workers and ensure meaningful participation and consultation of sex workers in any processes that are supposed to um, that are relevant to any laws and policies that impact their lives. And 
ensure that everyone's right to an adequate standard of living, including the right to housing, is realized. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anna. Charlotte, over to you. So hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Charlotte, and I'm from the ECP. So we are a grassroots uh, network of sex workers and supporters. Uh, campaigning for the decriminalization of sex work and resources such that we can leave sex work even when we want to. We are actually based in London, um, Northwest London in Kentish Town at the Crossroads Women's Center. And we have an international network both in the US, which is the US Prostitutes Collective, as well as in Thailand uh, with an organization called Empower. So um, as a sex worker collective in the UK, we really have come up against the Nordic model in many ways. So on a parliamentary level, much of our energy over the past decade has really gone to um, fighting initiatives to introduce Nordic model kind of um, type of legislation in the UK. Um, most recently, an MP called Diana Johnson actually put forward a private members bill, uh, what she called the sexual exploitation bill, and then tried to put the same set of clauses in the police bill. So we've seen you know, this uh, MP trying to put in legislation time and time again in different bills. And um, she's actually the MP for Hull um, in the north of England. And we know the women who work on the street in Hull very well. Uh, we were actually fighting uh, with them against a no prostitution zone in Hull. In Hull and uh, they are actually a collective of women who had um, experience working on the street and they are called an untold, untold story voices. So these women actually met with Diana Johnson um, after she had introduced uh, after she had you know, tried to introduce Nordic model kind of legislation and she ignored what her own constituents basically had to say to her. And so her proposals were defeated um, and an MP that we work with called Lynn Brown actually spoke very forcefully against um, the Nordic model in parliament, which was actually a first um, and we are very grateful for her support. But now Diana Johnson is the chair of a parliamentary committee on policing. Uh, so we really expect another onslaught very soon. Uh, but as we've heard, the Nordic model is repressive, it's pro-criminalization, it's pro-police, and it's premised on the fact that the police are the good guys and that increasing police powers and increasing criminalization is beneficial. And this is all justified in the name of gender equality. And for years, we've been opposing it on our own, but the tide has really been turning and we are you know, helped by the outpouring of grief and fury at the death of Sarah Everard, but also we are helped by the BLM movement, which really have, has echoed um, what we've been saying for decades, that the police have never been our saviors and that they act with impunity and are incredibly sexist and racist and discriminatory in so many ways. And the Nordic model is based on lies essentially, and it is a deliberate misrepresentation of who sex workers are. It characterizes sex workers as victims and not protagonists in our own struggle. It separates us from other women and other workers. Um, it, it, it ignores the fact that most sex workers are mums supporting families, supporting their kids, sometimes entire communities. And it also ignores the horrendous cost of living crisis, especially in the UK. One in five people in the UK are now living in poverty. And before COVID, it was 4 million children living in poverty. Asylum seekers are deliberately made destitute and are barely surviving on 39 pounds a week and benefit sanctions alone. And on, on top of that, you know, a decade of austerity has really driven thousands into prostitution. And it also ignores the low wages and exploitations in, um, in other jobs traditionally done by women. And we actually did our own grassroots research um, titled, What's a Nice Girl Like You Doing in a Job Like This? Where we compared sex work with other kinds of feminized labor. So carers, midwives, waitresses. And we found that sex work is not uniquely exploitative. It's just that sex workers could make more money in less time, but it was the only job where you had no protection. And it meant that you know being criminalized means that if anything happens to you while you're at work, you cannot fight it via the labor rights route. And you can only fight it through the criminal justice route and even then with criminalization and with stigma you, the, the odds are really stacked against you and so as we heard you know the demand for prostitution is really not from clients need for sex but from women's need for money and for women's poverty and we don't glorify prostitution by any means 
but there's no denying that when other jobs traditionally done by women pay so little, offer zero hour contracts, and you know, abusive employment conditions are really on the rise. Prostitution is a way of refusing poverty, of refusing exploitation and degradation that is imposed on us. And for politicians to call themselves feminists and call for more criminalization when moms and kids are going without is really appalling to us. And I would just like to quote um, one of the women in our network. She says, most of the other women that I meet on the street are there for very similar reasons, purely to keep their families together, their children out of care. It gives them a little bit of control about when to have the heating on or not, instead of having to stay in bed with the covers to stay warm. They go out for an hour and can pay a bill. This is not dishonest work. It is hard work. It is the only job that I have the time to do to fit in with my home life without neglecting my daughter. So another common justification for the Nordic model in the UK is that it's needed to stop trafficking and modern slavery, which we've heard a lot um, already. And in reality, trafficking is enabled by women's poverty and our determination to escape it alongside a hostile immigration environment. And anti-trafficking laws are used to strengthen immigration controls and target migrant women for arrest and deportation. And the funding for them has fueled rates and criminalization because the police justify their budgets by pointing to the policing of sex workers, um, exactly what you know Elaine has said. And so just some examples in Soho in 2013. So Soho is probably the most famous red light district in the entirety of UK, where sex workers have been working in the flats for years. Um, in 2013, there were mass raids where 250 uh, police officers in riot gear and with dogs broke down doors and dragged women um, in their underwear onto the street to waiting press. And they actually said to the press that these raids were needed to tackle trafficking and rape. Um, another woman in our network was raided eight times in the, uh, in the span of a few months, and she was shouted at and abused. And then the police asked if she was a victim of trafficking, while um, at the same time, she was actually a victim of stalking and domestic abuse, but the police were not interested in this. And also echoing um, what Eileen said, we are also working a case right now where a migrant woman is being investigated for trafficking just by um, helping her friends post advertisements just because she had better English. And we also come up against the Nordic model in many other areas. So in the UK, um, there has been a recent expansion of the violence against women and girls sector. And uh, up, up till recently, a lot of these sectors have, have actually supported the criminalization of clients and they defined all prostitution as exploitation and violence. And this has actually entered some of the official violence against women and girl policies. For example, in Brighton, um, the, the Vogue policy, VAWG, um, led to the advocating for the closure of brothels. We also seen the expansion of nil cap policies um, that ordered the closure of strip clubs. This has already happened in Bristol and in Edinburgh and in Hackney, and they are really expanding that as well. And um, I think Nina just now talked about services. So in in, in the UK, there's not really a lack of support services, but more that they have been, you know, encroached and infiltrated by that kind of violence against women and girls rhetoric. So they focus on exiting, um, but, you know, when they want us to exit, they require some kind of rehabilitation rather than making sure that uh, we have money in our hands and are able to exit. And it also ignores the fact that a giant barrier to exiting is criminalization. So if you get a caution um, for loitering and soliciting in the UK, it stays on your record for 100 years and it goes under sexual offenses, along with, you know, rapists and pedophiles, essentially, and it will come up on a DBS check. So if you want to leave sex work for a job where, for example, you know, working with the elderly or working with children, you'll never be able to um, get those jobs that traditionally women do. And also this um, has infected other areas like um, put, put the police have justified crackdowns of women on the street um, saying that they are targeting clients, but of course it's the women that are arrested and uh, targeted first and foremost. Uh, the police started saying um, sex workers are victims and this is used as a cover for more, a, a, a more sophisticated um, PR machine. Um, which is used to, again, um, push for more rates and heavier policing. So 
the police have even set up various kind of sex work safeguarding task forces and the national police chief guidelines um, do have a section that um, tells them how to engage with sex workers but this is of course never used in practice and they are just used to justify that they're actually considering you know sex worker welfare but in reality they do very little to stop uh, to stop rates and arrests and deportations so um, we were actually on a panel with um, Pion um, from Norway a couple of years ago and you know, it, it echoes what Julian said that the Nordic countries have very successfully exported their brand of social democracy and um, the Nordic model is just another faction of this publicity campaign, ignoring what's happening on the ground where um, the, the criminalization of clients, the violence from that is just absorbed by sex workers and this is all done um, in the name of gender equality, even though the policing of um, and the criminalization of sex workers really should be a feminist issue. So we appreciate the work of uh, people who have done this research and um, the sex worker led movement for the, for the CRIM that has fought to change uh, the terrain that made this research possible. And um, in 2017, uh, the Parliamentary Home Effects Committee in the UK actually recommended that the government change existing legislation so that soliciting is no longer an offence and brothel keeping provisions allow for sex workers to share premises. So this can be implemented immediately because these recommendations for the life of sex workers is really a matter of life and death. And so we say no to the Nordic model and we say outlaw poverty, not prostitution. Thank you. Thank you so much, Charlotte. Okay, over to you now, Susan. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let me just quickly, sorry for this. Sorry, it was so quick. I was uh, still looking at the last speaker and then I suddenly realized I had to speak. Thank, thank you so much for giving me the floor here today. And also thanks for the very, I have to say, very interesting speakers so far. Um, for La Strade International, you mentioned it already when you announced me earlier, we are an anti-trafficking platform representing 30 member organizations in 24 European countries. Uh, trafficking for sexual exploitation has always been a major focus of our attention and our work since our establishment, which is uh, more than 26 years ago now. Even though uh, other forms of human trafficking also related to other sectors have become increasingly visible over the last years. We've always, from the start that we were established, we've always advocated for rights protection of sex workers, as for us, this is part of the human rights based approach towards human trafficking. We respect the rights of all persons to make their own individual decisions, including, of course, the decision to undertake sex work, wherever that's regularized in the country or not, because we really feel that human beings should be able to make their own decisions. Since our establishment, uh, as I mentioned, 26 years ago, we have always is opposed also the criminalization of sex workers or clients of sex workers. So as such, uh, we are one of the examples of anti-trafficking organizations uh, that are not supporting the Nordic model. So, um, and, and, and we do recognize that many of them uh, do, uh, but uh, please also know that uh, actually the anti-trafficking field is also quite diverse and there are organizations like us that do not support it. Uh, the prostitution sector is indeed what we see when we focus on human trafficking. It's indeed one of the sectors which is very to uh, exploitation and abuse. And that's in particular, and some of the speakers already mentioned this very clearly, many persons work without adequate protection and support. Uh, there's also not much awareness for uh, how they have to work. There's not much support, as already mentioned. And very often, of course, it's also not a regulated sector, but a hidden sector with a lack of control for the conditions to be in place. So that, of course, makes sex workers very, very vulnerable. We also see that human trafficking occurs both in countries where sex work is legal and in countries where aspects of commercial sex is criminalized. And the persons we have assisted over all these years include persons who were forced into prostitution, but also many, many persons that consented to provide sexual services and to work as a sex worker. But still, they became victims of human trafficking mainly because they were deceived, the conditions of work and payment were not what they were promised and they were severely exploited and abused. 
So hence, uh, for years, we see the conflation. Hence, that's also why we oppose uh, uh, criminalizations. For years, we've seen the conflation between human trafficking and prostitution. And again, we heard also other speakers saying that already, uh, and being used as the argument to find human trafficking. While over the last 26 years that we are active in the field, we've never seen any valid evidence that criminalization of sex workers or clients of sex workers has actually helped to reduce human trafficking. Uh, still, the Nordic model, as also mentioned by several of you already, is strongly promoted to find human trafficking, in particular also by Sweden and France, but also any other countries. I would therefore like to shortly reflect also on the demand debate in the anti-trafficking field and on the issue of criminalizing the knowingly use and the impact on reducing human trafficking. I hope to stick to the time because I know that uh, uh, we're late already. As we already heard from the other speakers in the anti-trafficking field, there's much debate on the issue of reducing demand for human trafficking. And the demand concept has always been introduced by those that actually aim to abolish prostitution. However, since the demand concept, and that's more than 20 years ago, was introduced in international anti-trafficking legislation. There has never been a common understanding of what addressing demand means, and it's often, very often, translated or interpreted as the need to criminalize sex work or clients of sex workers, or the criminalization of the knowingly use of services, even though international legislation states, actually, that all demand that fosters exploitation should be addressed. If we look at European legislation, there's in particular Article 18 of the 2011 AU Trafficking Directive, which currently is the main AU instrument related to human trafficking. And this relates to the prevention of human trafficking. And this, are, this article and this directive states that member states shall take appropriate measures, such as education and training, to discourage and reduce the demand that fosters all forms of exploitation related to trafficking human beings. And this article, Article 18.4 of this directive further states that member states shall consider taking measures to establish as a criminal offense the use of services which are the objects of exploitation with the knowledge that the person is a victim of human trafficking. At the time, and this is of course also why the debate is so strong, because it's in the international legislation, but it's very often wrongly, uh, uh, trans long, wrongly interpreted and very often just seen as we need to criminalize prostitution and then we would address human trafficking. At the time of the elaboration of the trafficking directive back in 2011, there was a strong call to make this provision even binding for all EU member states. However, that was not supported. But currently, and that's important to know, the AU Anti-Trafficking Directive is again evaluated. There are two evaluating agencies, Ernst and Young and Rent, that together with the Commission are evaluating uh, the Anti-Trafficking Directive. And um, actually, there are um, a strong call to revise the Trafficking Directive. And the main reason for the revision of this directive is actually to make this specific provision on criminalizing the knowingly use uh, binding. Uh, before I go into criminalizing the knowingly use, just to say that, of course, it's not only a mentioned in the AU trafficking directive of the AU, but it's also mentioned 20 years ago already in the UN Palermo Protocol of November 2000, and also mentioned in the AU Council of Europe Convention on Action Against Trafficking. Um, for us, it's very strange to now call for a revision of the anti-trafficking directive just because of this provision and to really call for, um, for, for, for criminalizing the knowingly use. Uh, of course, we know that French currently, France currently has the chairmanship and there are, they are behind also this call, but also other member states. And uh, we think it's a very odd reasons and, and absolutely no need to re revise the EU trafficking directive for that because also as acknowledged by the European Commission itself, by the FEM and the Libre Comité, and by many other relevant actors that work in the anti-trafficking field, the main issue with the trafficking directive and any other policies and measures currently uh, that, that seem not have to have positive impact is because they are currently not adequately implemented. So we absolutely do not see the need for this revision. Moreover, we also, as an anti-trafficking platform, we consider criminalization of sexual services or of bias of sexual services at odds with human rights-based approach and victim rights. 
As mentioned already by the earlier speakers, we see that repressive prostitution policies have been stigmatizing, marginalizing, marginalizing effects on sex workers and also on trafficked persons. The criminalization measures to address sexual exploitation have often led to increases of violence and other human rights violations of sex workers and do not do much to protect their rights, as is also evidenced again by the numerous studies uh, and also highlighted again by earlier speakers today. Criminalization measures have also moved the sector much more underground, due to which the sex workers have even less access to information and support measures. They cannot safely report exploitation and abuse, and there's actually not much chance that sexual exploitation and human trafficking, uh, therefore, uh, is reported. And we see also all over in all the European countries, a very strong under-reporting and under-identification of human trafficking cases. Moreover, the, the more prostitution we feel in sex work falls into the area of Ill illegality, the more trafficked persons are also dependent, of course, on their exploiters. So this should change. Um, a few words about the impact of criminalizing the knowingly use uh, for the prevention and the prosecution of human trafficking. Mm -hmm. uh, just to say that there has been so far, one minute, <laughs> just to say that so far there has been only one evaluation done on this provision, which is already back in 2016, which is five, five years uh, after the establishment of the directive. And actually this evaluation report, which is published by the European uh, Commission, does not provide much evidence on positive impact of criminalizing the knowingly use as always has been claimed. Uh, I wanted to say a little bit more about which countries have it adopted, uh, what's the impact so far, but just to say very briefly that of those countries that have um, criminalized the knowingly use of sexual services, uh, we see hardly any uh, prosecutions and investigations on this article. In the Netherlands, the legislation is very new, so of course, there's also not much evidence there, but in general, we see that is, uh, there's not much. So um, just to conclude, we see the negative impact of criminalizing the bias of sexual services on the rights of sex workers and on trafficked persons. We strongly doubt about the feasibility and the effectiveness of binding legislation on criminalizing the knowingly use. And we also still see that we have, um, there's in general, that much more effort should be taken to prosecute the perpetrators, including also companies and others, and also have much more focus on all the different sectors. And we should stop having the focus always only on the prostitution sector. Um, I had to be a bit in a rush, uh, uh, but I'll leave it here because maybe there will be later other questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susan, and thank you so much to all the speakers for absolutely interesting insights there into the Nordic model. So we'll now open the floor to questions from the audience. Please type short questions into the Q&A box and I'll try to answer it. Well, the speakers will try to answer as many as possible. So I can already see that we have a question for Elaine. Um, what is the percentage of migrant sex workers in Canada? Is it along the same lines as Nina's presentation? So I think for Butterfly, we mainly work with the people uh, like um, over 30 years old and, and sometimes we have workers even like 50, 60 years old. And I think they create the illusion they are the young, underage, uh, uh, ignorant Asian woman is still, again, is the, the illusion and stigma. And I saw other question is like, they assume all the Asian worker are being trafficked. So this is a very racist assumption. And this is exactly like 100 years ago that when Canada banned the Chinese woman to come to Canada. So I think that is very important that we need to stop that kind of like, um, like misinformation, you know, about like most sex workers are underage, most sex workers, you know, are, are, are being trapped is, 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 is not uh, like this situation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Elaine. We have a question for all the panelists, but perhaps um, Nina, you could kick off the discussion. Are there particular, this is sorry, a question from Louise McCudden. Are there particular challenges for sex workers in accessing sexual and reproductive health care and exercising reproductive rights? And what can providers of contraception, vasectomy and abortion do to A, support sex workers in accessing our services and B, advocate for those clients? 
Um, I think that the sex worker organizations could be maybe best to answer to this, but um, I could say so that um, that um, I think one way, uh, like I think there is, of course, uh, special limitations because of the stigma. So can you talk about sex work with your healthcare provider uh, and whether they have uh, knowledge of the special needs of, of sex workers? So what I would say that how to do better or support sex workers in accessing services, uh, reproductive services, um, is to be open for, for sex workers and like not have a judgmental attitude and kind of like play that out uh, openly in your reception, in your service descriptions and so on. But maybe, um, I don't know if some of the, the sex worker organization, would you Charlotte or Elena uh, wanna say something about this? Charlotte? Uh, yeah, sure, okay. Um, so hmm. I feel like, okay, so we are a campaigning organization and our main, and we also do our casework, um, but we mainly, you know, campaign for changes in law and policy. There are a lot of other organizations out there that are what we call um, service organizations and they are the people that, you know, drive the trucks, the, the healthcare trucks around and like give out condoms and um, lube and um, stuff like that. But, um, but I think my main point that I would like to make is that um, I feel like the stigma has been so bad in a lot of cases where we've had uh, a woman on network who basically, um, let me see, how do I phrase this? You will because of stigma, you'll never know whether a healthcare professional will be on your side or not. And a lot of times it can be, you know, uh, it can be it can be really a lottery. Um, it's not directly related to sex work, but for example, we uh, we know of this uh, lady on network. She basically was would like to you know um, go on antidepressants and wanted to um, and was in her mental health state for quite a while. But she has never wanted to uh, reveal this to her doctor uh, for fear that the doctor would data share, for example, with the family courts and that her kids would be taken uh, uh, away from her or her custody of her grandkids would be taken away from her. So when you see this kind of this level of distrust in state institutions, especially in the UK, where we have the NHS, um, that is really a, a big barrier. And that's really a material consequence of, of, of stigma. And especially when it comes to your kids, you know, you really do not want to do anything to risk your kids being taken away. So that's just uh, my two cents. Thank you, Charlotte. If there's anybody else who wants to jump in on that question, um, otherwise we can move on. Okay, there's a question here from Adrian Lee. Was decriminalization of sex workers more prevalent in the 1970s? For example, in Rotterdam, Holland, there was the government provision of official premises. However, this led to the sex workers to pay on their earnings. So, um, Nina, perhaps? Okay, um, well, there's been kind of a change uh, maybe in the 70s. I cannot um, say exactly to the situation uh, in the Netherlands as, as that's not my kind of research area. But like we can see that in the 60s and 70s, there was increased decriminalization when there was kind of a move away in the Western countries from these kind of Christian um, uh, ideas of, of, of sexuality and sexual morals. Uh, so this was moved away from, from the, the area of criminalization uh, at the same time as, for example, um, homosexuality was decriminalized and, and, and so on. So definitely there was a turn uh, to decriminalization then in the late 1990s, the kind of the anti-trafficking movement uh, kind of rose and, and um, kind of uh, this kind of cycle of recriminalization kind of started. But I see that Charlotte has her hand up, so I'll, I'll give the floor to her. Go ahead, Charlotte. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I think just to clarify, um, currently like the, the system in very famously in Amsterdam now with their red light districts, um, those, that, that is not decriminalization, that's actually legalization where, um, you know, sex work can only legally occur within like a certain premise in certain streets, there's certain hours that you can work and not. 
Um, and we also oppose that because that is uh, to us just state pimping and that um, we just want to be regarded as you know any other worker. And what ha what the problem with, le with legalization um, is that it basically creates a two-tiered system. You have to give your um, personal details to the state and there are certain people, there are certain groups of people, migrant people, uh, people of color, um, trans people who basically cannot afford to do that. And there'll be people who work within the legalized system where they have the protections and there'll be people who work outside it. So that's as good as you know it not being um, decriminalized, yeah. Thank you, Charlotte. Um, we have a question from Kate Downing, an LSE visitor. I think this one might be a good one for Anna. Um, you've said the violence and negative effects of the Nordic model are highly racialized. What is the experience of non-migrant or non-migrant passing sex workers? Do you think the model could work if immigration laws and practices were not hostile? Thank you for the question. I think it's a very good one. And in fact, I did speak to a few sex workers who are migrants in Ireland, but who are white passing, like um, like Kate mentioned, who did notice how this uh, has been helpful to them in, in terms of um, how they are being perceived by clients, by the authorities. Um, you know, as long as people don't know, one person said, what's in my passport? I, I, uh, I know that I have certain privileges because of that. Um, but in general, um, in this particular research we spoke to, it was really 50-50 in terms of migrant sex workers and Irish sex workers. And really the vast majority were in favor of decriminalization of, um, of a change of, of the legal model, you know, decriminalization of all aspects of sex work. So it's the racialization and migration uh, policies are only one aspect of how this model impacts on people's human rights. So unfortunately, unfortunately I don't think that would be um, that would be a, a solution. And, and just in general, perhaps also to say that um, a lot of our interviewees really wanted to stress, and, and this is something that we also recognize as an organization, that decriminalization of sex work is only one aspect of, um, it's only one piece of the puzzle in terms of what would need to change to make sex workers' rights better and their um, human rights realized better. Um, so, you know, decriminalization of sex work is not going to in itself resolve absolutely everything. And, and as we all um, discussed, there's a lot of systemic and structural issues at play. Um, that wouldn't just be kind of magically resolved. It's, it's only one element of, of um, what both migrant and Irish sex workers were um, would like to see happen, what they were recommending. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, we have a question for all the panel from um, Lulu Samborska, who is an LSE visitor. As, that, as Nina outlined, a small minority of sex workers in the Nordic region are trafficked. The majority make a choice to work in this industry. Despite that, how do you think governments can go about reducing that number? What type of policy would be most effective to tackle that? Susan, would you like to take a stab at that? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, I just wanted also to comment to what was earlier said. I thought it was interesting what happened in the past. So we say that um, uh, the situation was different when it was less Christian groups, and 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 then we say, okay, when the anti-trafficking, then then Nina said, when the anti-trafficking movement came up, then suddenly changed. I think it's not necessarily the anti-trafficking movement, sorry to say, but I think it's still the religious groups which are now so active and the conservative. Uh, 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 streams, let's say, and unfortunately, <laughs> they are also very present in the anti-trafficking field. So I think it's still connected also with those waves. As for this one, um, yeah, what we promote is, of course, workers' rights. I mean, especially now when you see with human trafficking, um, it's not only happening in the prostitution sector, and also those people who have these very simple solutions and say, let's criminalize sex workers or let's criminalize buying. They also know that with that, yeah, uh, even if it would have had an impact, uh, we would not solve all the other anti all the other trafficking cases and all the other sectors as well. So we are very strongly supporting that uh, 
people should be treated as workers. They should have workers' rights. They should be have a decent working conditions. They should be able to report, safely report, be able to, to go to the police without any, any negative impact, without being immediately detained. So we are really uh, uh, promoting this. And I think the fin funny thing is that if you speak with a lot of um, anti-trafficking uh, stakeholders at governmental level, they always understand what we mean if we talk about other sectors. But the moment you translate this for the, 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 the sex industry, they don't understand it anymore. And sometimes it's even funny. We had, um, together with ESVA, we were in discussions with the OECE, and we also said, I mean, sex workers should speak more often at defense, and they should be much more consultant, and, and, uh, um, and, and they sometimes feel that they have to choose between trafficked persons or sex workers. So in order to support trafficked persons, they cannot support sex workers anymore. But we say very often this is the same person. So, uh, so don't make this uh, this distinction. Uh, even a person who did not consent to work in in, in sex work still would uh, would profit from better working conditions in the sector. So that's uh, that's our answer. Thank you so much, Susan. We've got a question uh, for Julian. Um, from Marianne Vijas, a Netherlands Dutch platform for advancing sex workers' rights, and he's doing a PhD on human rights and sex worker rights at Essex. Do you see a difference in policing male and female sex workers, given that women are considered to be victims and men perpetrators? Yeah, um, definitely. Uh, I mean, in Sweden, uh, the kind of profiling is uh, like mostly uh, women, uh, both trans and cis and non-binary, like female presenting people. Um, and uh, I mean, there's not really any data that I'm aware of, like if uh, there is arrests of male sex workers in Sweden, maybe Nina knows more, <laughs> but I don't think it exists. But uh, so yeah, I would say it's very gendered. Nina, would you like to jump in there? I have a question for you if you want, if you would prefer to answer that one. Yeah, there I I, I can just um, confirm what uh, what Julian said that I, I don't I think I've looked at some uh, police reports or something and it's it's mostly women. It's like that's what the or female presenting uh, that they target. So in a way, if you think about also the background of the law as kind of and the understanding of, of commercial sex as a violence against women. So then the perpetrator is male and, and the victim uh, is, is female. So um, this shows also in the policing. Thank you, Nina. We have a question for you from um, an LSC student who's doing an MSc in, in I think, gender studies, uh, Jolly Gosh. Um, she asks how the Nordic model distinguishes between sex work and sex between an unmarried couple. Is the model framed on the grounds of female victim subject in the case of S FSW or sexual moralities? Um, I think that the differentiation is um, is compensation. So that's, you know, there needs to be money or services. There's increasing uh, money or kind of some sort of other compensation. So um, there's also increasing attention around um, uh, sugaring and these kind of things that uh, that the kind of the Swedish um, police and audience are um, concerned um, and they uh, frame them all under kind of uh, like prostitution. Um, so that the compensation is the difference. Um, and then thinking about the morals like um, it's definitely like like based on the idea of female victimhood, uh, especially in kind of like sexual exchange, because in a way, uh, according to this kind of ideology, like person can never fully consent uh, to, to to selling sex because um, uh, there is money involved. Um, and about morality is like, um, it's kind of like this radical feminist morality or morality of, of of, of a good sex uh, that should be ha happening uh, among equals. So kind of all kind of money or age difference or all kind of these kind of things in a way pollute this, this idea of good sex that is promoted uh, by the state. Um, so yeah, I hope this answers your question. 
Thanks, Nina. We've got another question for you and Julian. Uh, could, from uh, Jaffa Latif Najjar, who is doing a PhD researcher at the International Institute of Social Studies at The Hague. Could you please share your insights, experience on how sex workers in Nordic countries navigate the everyday institutional social harms, such as stigma, incarceration, exclusion, racial discrimination, et cetera, at their personal and collective manner? Um, and then there's another question for Susan, if we have time, but um, do you want to, Julian or Nina? I think Julian would be uh, best to answer to this one, but I can just say that um, like navigating institutional uh, and social harm, like what I said, that there isn't uh, like really any support services available, uh, even legal counseling is really hard to get. Um, so uh, I think what uh, Julian and Red, um, Red Umbrella are doing is really important, like providing this community to, to help people to navigate, but uh, maybe um, you can, Julian, talk more to this question um, and the important work you do in Sweden? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's like Nina said, like we are trying to uh, uh, create and sustain a community and connect people because it's so often uh, that uh, members have been working as a sex worker for like 10 years and they're like, this is the first time I ever met another sex worker. Like it's extremely isolating. Uh, so I think, it's hard to say like one kind of way how people cope and navigate uh, this oppressive system, um, but definitely uh, building of community is very important so we can share uh, like both emotionally, but also like educate each other across the experiences of the different type of work we do in sex work and how also these laws affect us differently depending on our identities and how society projects uh different oppressive uh methods on us um but yeah we also find it very important to advocate and also we're looking for allies and especially in sweden we're looking for people who will speak up uh, and help humanize us because at the moment sex workers are being dehumanized uh, at an alarming rate uh, in all the countries uh, that have the, the Swedish or Nordic or end demand or client criminalization, whatever you want to call it. Uh, uh, so yeah, that's my answer. Thank you so much, uh, Julian. I wonder if we have just uh, time for just one more. Um, and one that, sorry, was for Susan, was please share your insights experience on the sex work policy that the Netherlands followed so far. So a, a brief response, please, Susan. I was just saying, I saw that there was a question of my young days. If someone is an expert on this, you should have given the floor to her. Um, uh, but yeah, in general, I mean, it's again, um, it's difficult. Um, uh, we have it legalized. Uh, there are, of course, on that sense, the government is also supporting it. And that sense, is, of course, much more rights for people. But also still here, we see, of course, uh, bottlenecks. We see uh, uh, always the time, like, uh, who can work in prostitution or not. Uh, the, 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 um, uh, the fact that they need to be registered is all the time uh, modeled for, uh, for discussion. And also, we have now, since January, the, the criminalizing the knowingly use in the Netherlands as well, which was indeed pushed also again by uh, um, uh, Christian parties. I, for my, uh, I very much also rely on the Dutch actors. We have two members in the Netherlands, so prostitution policies in the Netherlands is not my daily field of work. But yeah, we see still also here that it's not perfect. But one good positive thing maybe to mention what I thought was very positive and also quite rare. Uh, last week, there was an event organized by the Dutch government together with the university, the Free University, and also partly the Dutch Rapporteur on Human Trafficking. And Eswa was on stage, Eswa was invited to speak. So I think that's already a major step that a sex worker was allowed to speak and to uh, to, to intervene in the anti-traffic, in the, yeah, in the, the issue of bad, the, the focus was on traffic for sexual exploitation. So that was a major, major win, I would say. Thanks so much, Susan. Um, just a quick question to the speakers. Do you have time for one more question? Thumbs up. <laughs> okay, great. So I think let's end on this question, which I think is really interesting. Do you feel that the introduction of social media has changed the perception of sex work 
since the introduction of Nordic style policies, either positively or negatively. And that's from Samantha Pegg. Who wants to um, give that one a go? I can go, um, but maybe like not specifically um, in relation to the introduction of Nordic style policies, but in general, I mean, OnlyFans has exploded as a cultural phenomenon within the past like five years. And I guess that that's a very visible form of sex work that um, people are now doing partially in response to the pandemic. But I would just like to say that the hierarchy is real and that even though, um, you know, some people can afford to go online during the pandemic, a lot of women have not been able to, especially in our network, they had to risk, you know, their health and um, being able to feed their families. And that um, I think a lot, there's a lot of discussion around, you know, whether these um, online sex workers lives we change forever because now you know all their photos are online etc but that kind of witch hunting and stigma has has been prevalent way before the internet when women were out in newspapers etc um, and just like to, just to get a quick word in on that question from Kate Downing about um, whether the Nordic model would work if there was no hostile immigration policy still no because it is premised on the assumption that um, it, to eliminate like demand for sex work and to abolish like sex work altogether, which will never happen um, unless you really address larger underlying issues, as we said, of poverty. Thanks, Elaine. I think you wanted to jump in on that question. Ah, thank you. And I think social media is like at this one hand is really helpful, you know, particularly how the sex worker can organize together and particularly for many sex worker for like member of Butterfly, they cannot come to the meeting, they can assess information, they can share information and build the solidarity. And I think today we do not have a lot of like time to talk about it, but how to build the solidarity and how to make the voice being heard, I think it's very, very important. And using social media actually can push back the dominant by the mainstream media, particularly many of the, the migrant sex worker story not being heard uh, in the public. And, and also they need to be framed in a particular way, but having social media, and I think this is a very important piece, but we also see how anti-trafficking movement, they have so much resources and then also using it to promote a harmful idea and I think this is um, both sides and so and really glad to be here and it's so great uh, to connect with all of you and we would like to promote the coming um, meeting uh, we will have an event next week because as I mentioned many anti-trafficking organizations work with the state to shut down the Asian massage parlor and extend the policing not only border the people at the border but the border the people like impose the bordering and policing everyday life of the worker so that is really demonstrate how xenophobia and homophobia and racism intersect together. We really hope you can join. This is not only an academic event, but this is also a political event to tell the city called Newmarket to stop this racist uh, policies. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elaine. I think this is a good moment to end the this wonderful event. So it's been an absolute pleasure to have the opportunity for both me and, and I think for all of you to listen to our speakers today. If you would like to learn more about some of the organizations that have been discussed today, you can follow the relevant links that have been sent in the chat. You can also read Dr. Nina's policy brief on this very topic, which will be published on the 20th of June via LSE Center for Women and Peace and Security. Thank you to our speakers for such excellent discussions and to all of you in the audience for listening. Thank you very much.